Okay, so we are going to actually introduce the CSI 26 topic right now because it is a data structure. And so it's one last little bit of knowledge before you leave. Uh, there is one last quiz for today uh, that was written by Lewis. Uh, it is not on this topic, though. The topic we're going to learn today is graph theory. This is a CSI 26 topic. Aaron loves graph theory. So these are not the graphs we're talking about, okay? Uh, these are the graphs that we're talking about. And uh, a graph is a bunch of points connected by lines. And if you're like, okay, well, what does that mean? Uh, they, they can kind of mean anything. Like there are so many different uses for, for graphs and graph theory that it's easier to just, to give lots of examples um, than, uh, than to just say what it is. But like a vertex is like a thing. And an edge is like a relationship between the things, I guess is kind of the best way of, of putting it. So uh, a point is a vertex and a line between them is called an edge. And yeah, yeah, <laughs> exactly, exactly, yeah. Uh, connect the dots is graph theory. So each of the vertices is a dot and then you draw edges between them based on the numbers. Yeah, that's good. Um, Graph theory appears a lot in movies because it looks, it, there's a visual element to it that Hollywood likes. Uh, Matt Damon here in Good Will Hunting is solving actually a very easy uh, graph theory problem. But um, in the movie, it's supposed to be this like thing that took MIT mathematicians, you know, 20 years to prove or something. And it's, it's actually very like, usually when you take 26, I just do this in class and just have students solve it. Uh, and it looks cool. Like, it looks like aliens, like, you know, are coming down to Earth. And <laughs> it is a good movie. It is a good movie. It's kind of the breakout movie for Matt Damon and Ben Affleck. So, um, I think, was it Mini Driver is in it? Is that the girl? Yeah. So. Uh, so the vertices and edges can represent something being connected to something else. And if that's vague and unhelpful, yeah, it is. Um, it's because it's used so, in so many places. It's hard to say, well, a, a dot is a city or a dot is a person. And, and the line represents friendship. Like it, it could mean that, but it could mean a lot of things. Right. And so, for example, you could use a graph to represent adjacency. So, for example, uh, if you've ever seen like a map of the United States, actually did this in CSI 1. Uh, this is their homework that was due today. So can you color the states of America in using only four colors such that no state is touching another state with the same color? This is graph theory. And you're like, well, that doesn't look like a graph. Well, what you do is you represent the relationship of being adjacent to as a line. Okay, so each dot is a state, like this one's Nebraska, this one's South Dakota, I don't know. And the line means they're touching each other. And then you can take this graph and then do a coloring, graph coloring algorithm on it, such that you've colored it so that no two colors are touching each other. And so in CSI 1, the thing that's due today for them is they have to go onto an online, like, puzzle game app and, like, four color a map, you know. And uh, that's graph theory, okay? Uh, graphs can also represent relationships. So for example, uh, in Facebook, they hold your friends as a graph. So like, if this is me and I've got two friends, I got Aaron and I got, uh, Bishop here and Aaron is friends with Bencourt and Bishop is friends with Bencourt and Bishop's friends with, uh, Renee and, and Eric. It's a bi-directional relationship, you know, friendship. And once you have this sort of graph constructed, for all billion people using Facebook, then you can do things on it, like advertise to them, <laughs> right? So like, let's say, let's say if, uh, let's say Ben Court, who we're saying is this vertex down here. Ben Court is friends with Bishop and he's friends with Aaron. Uh, let's say Ben Court like gets heavily into vaping, right? Then uh, there's a good chance that I would actually be interested in vaping because hobbies spread virally through social networks. That's why it's called a social network. It's a network, right? Um, exercise spreads virally through a network. Like if if a per, if one of the people in your friend group 
starts going to the gym and like starts losing weight and is eating fit. I just had a donut. It's not me. Um, and is like working out the people adjacent to them on the graph are much more likely to start exercising and eating healthy and losing weight as well. And so these effects will distribute through the graph. And so you could advertise to them because that's, you know, that's Facebook's reason to it's right. Is Facebook is there to figure out what you're going to buy and then put up ads saying, okay, here's some exercise equipment or some dumbbell barbell, you know, kinds of things. Um, networking is craft theory too. Exactly. Routing things on the internet. Let's say that you've got a, uh, um, you know, this is my home uh, router here. And then this is uh, the router for like uh, Aaron's computer over here. And it routes for me to Comcast, then from Comcast to at and and then from at and to Aaron. Uh, maybe we could have routed out through like, I don't know, MCI or something like that and gone that way. And so all of the routers on the internet are constantly running an algorithm called VGP that is kind of like figuring out who they're connected to and what the fastest routes are. And so if I, if I tell my computer to connect to Google, it'll actually use graph theory to figure out what the shortest route is on it. So if we go over onto the server, even you, we can see this, Let's see here, trace route, trace route to www.ucsd.edu. So we're going to find the shortest route from the server, which is in a data center in, um, it's in a data center in, uh, Fremont, it's going to find the shortest route to UCSD. And it looks like um, these are like internal routers. That is the probably the exit node for Linode. Linode then connects to Akamai. So Akamai is a probably one of the biggest, most important internet companies that nobody's heard of. Um, they have they keep caches of people's websites at local places all around the internet. They have a distributed caching system. So that when you try to view a website, it'll hit the cache instead of hitting the original website. So probably it looks like UCSD is not actually um, at, hosted at UCSD. So let's see, if, let's see if we can find any of the actual hosts. Science 9. Okay, there we go. All right. Science 9 is like the, uh, the CSI 41 server. It's still up. That's cool. Makes me happy. All right. So you can see here the routing. It's going like inside of the data center in Linode. And then it goes to the exit node. Then it goes to Scenic, which is a back a backbone service that runs up um, California. And let's see here. It's going to go through a 300 gig connection. Uh, drum, uh, it's probably TC less than that. And then TC LAX, LAS to Tustin, probably. That's probably LA, Tustin. These are all 300 gig, 100 gig lines. Uh, San Diego to Tustin. So these are these are hops as it's probably going down San Diego. I'm I'm curious about this DC thing though. Like, did it go to the District of Columbia? That would be weird because I believe I'm in. I believe that I'm in Fremont. Although they could, it's in the cloud, so who knows where I am now? That's that's actually interesting. They might have they might have moved where the uh, the server is physically located. Where is DC SVL? Where are you? Austin. Is this DC to Austin? You see Davis, Cal Poly. Hmm. Now I'm curious about this kind of stuff. Great job, scenic.net. Okay, yeah, <laughs> Backbone Provider doesn't have a website. Cool. Well, uh, yeah, so I can, I can, if I dug into it, I can find out where these things are. But basically what's happening is that it's navigating through router to router to router to router as it's going across maybe the country, if, if that DC is in fact Washington, DC. I don't know what SVL is. Um, and then DC to LAX, to Tustin, to San Diego. Then UCSD is connected to uh, scenic.net there. And then we're probably going to be inside of the UCSD system here. Yep. And then 
uh, UCSD has a router here, and then a routes to there, then a routes to there, and then that is ing9. And all of that process took 11 milliseconds. So it takes 11 milliseconds for a packet to go from DC. I, that seems mm, I don't I don't think it I don't think we can get 11 millisecond ping if it was coming from DC. Honestly, I don't, I don't know what the DC stands for. Um, let's just say it's let's just say it's Fremont. So it takes 11 11 milliseconds for a packet to go from. Uh, Fremont down through 13 hops to get to the UCSD computer science server. Okay. Line node is called Lin. Cloud computing, yeah, it could be DC, the cloud. I don't know. I'll have, to, I'll have to dig into that. But do you guys get what I'm talking about here? Like this is um, this is going through a graph. Does that make sense to you guys? So you can dig up graphs of the internet from like back in the day. So here's here is a graph of the internet in 1970. <laughs> you can have every host on the internet. Uh, it's a little bit bigger than this one. So you can see University of Southern California is connected to Stanford. PDB tens are a type of computer. Uh, UC Santa Barbara is connected to UC LA, which is connected to UC San Diego. Uh, and they have w like one machine on it, on the internet, you know. Uh, Rand Corporation is a research uh, think tank kind of thing. Uh, Ames is up in uh, San Jose, Mountain View area. Uh, research, Lawrence Livermore, connected to uh, Utah, connected to UIUC probably, connected to MIT. So it goes for like MIT. MIT to UIUC to Utah, like that's the internet, right? And then MIT uh, has a couple machines on the internet. Look at that. Um, Harvard, uh, Aberdeen, MBS, ETAC, Miters, Stack, or Carnegie Mellon. Yeah, so this is this is the entire internet. <laughs> this is the entire internet. And so, like, if you wanted to, if if you wanted to send a a, a packet on the internet from like UCSD to UC Santa Barbara. You could route it all the way around this way, right? But that'd be super inefficient. And so a graph theory problem would be like, what is the fastest route from UCSD to UC Santa Barbara? And the answer is obviously go to UCLA, then go to UCSB. So you send a packet to UCLA, UCLA's packet picks it up and routes it to UC Santa Barbara, and then UC Santa Barbara routes it to their IBM mainframe here. And then the mainframe responds, I don't know who you are, and it bounces back this way to your microbio, and, and then you have a little back and forth that way. Does this make sense to you guys? Like this is this is graph theory. I had a slide for that. Digital California. All right, cool. Thanks for looking that up for me. So I was like, mm, you can't get a packet across the country. Speed of light problem, right? You can't get it. You can't get it across the country in in uh, eleven milliseconds. Uh, and then you can see you have like a transatlantic link here. It's going to connect over to London. So uh, that's graph theory. Okay. So let's uh, let's ask you guys a question. What is the fastest route from Saint Minneapolis Saint Paul to Columbus? So what, what route would you take? Let's say each of these routes takes an equal amount of time and we can mix it up a little bit. Which, uh, which route from one Minneapolis, St. Paul to seven Columbus, Ohio is the fastest. What do you guys think? Can you guys solve this graph theory problem? Very good. Yes, one to three to seven is the correct answer. But now let's make it a little more complicated. Let's see, got a mouse. Got a thing. There we go. Okay. Ah, it's another thing. Okay. 
Nope, it's still doing the thing. Why is it doing the thing? Okay. We're good. We're good. Yeah, yeah. Disconnected again. Okay, there you go. Let's put some numbers on here. So let's say this is 100 miles, this is 50 miles, this is 200 miles, this is 300 miles, this is 50 miles, this is 50 miles, this is 200 miles, 100 miles, 50 miles. What is the fastest route? From my tablet is breaking. Ah, oh, doesn't matter. Okay, what is the fastest route from uh, Minneapolis, St. Paul to Columbus now? What do you guys think? A lot of possibilities now, right? What do you think? One to two to three. Now, rather than going one to two to three, you just go one to three because it's 100 instead of 150. You'll stick with 137? I think you're right. I think 137 is faster still. All right. So if my tablet will work for like a second. So uh, mix it up a little bit. Let's make that a thousand. That a thousand. Okay, what's the fastest right now? It's a problem with micro USB connections is that the ports always like bend and break. You wiggle the thing, and it turns on and turns off. Nope, oh, disconnected. One, two, five, three, seven. Let's see here. Two to three. Now one to two to five to three to seven. That's correct. That is correct. That is correct. Okay. Let's see if I can get this to work. Let's make one more change here. How about now? The distance between Des Moines and Springfield is now negative. 300 miles. Is that physically possible? No. But uh, real life story, this actually happened in real life. So in real life, somebody entered a negative route distance for the internet and it broke the internet. Because uh, you're, you're now the fastest route. One to four to five to three to seven. Uh, it looks good. That's a total distance of zero. It's pretty good. It's pretty good. I can do better though. I can do better than zero. How about we go from one to four to five to four to five to four to five to four. Let's do another thing again. To five, to four, to five. Now, when you're sending a network packet, there's a maximum hop length of 32. There's something called a time to live on a packet. And every time a router routes something, it will decrement it by one. And if it ever hits zero, then it discards the packets. So you don't have packets kind of floating around infinitely. Uh, and so basically the fastest route possible would be going this way and then going back and forth in a loop as many times as you can until finally routing to three to seven. That is the fastest route. So if a person were to uh, enter a negative route distance between two edges on the internet, and let's say that the people who made the algorithm didn't expect somebody would be dumb enough to enter a negative number, then the internet will crash, which is kind of kind of what happened. Um, it was faster to send a packet Mathematically, like if you're in Beijing, you're trying to send a packet to Shanghai. It was faster to send that packet over to 
uh, Des Moines, bounce it back and forth between Des Moines and Springfield 30 times, or you know, 25 times or whatever, and then send it to Shanghai. And if you're sending an email from London to Aberdeen in Scotland, it was faster, according to the math, to send it from London over to this farmland in the Midwest, bounce it back and forth 20 times, and then send it to Scotland. So the entire internet tried to route itself through one very poor quality connection out in some farmland in the Midwest. And it actually took out the internet. This is back in the 90s. So uh, this is why, this is one of the reasons why TDD is important and why thinking about edge conditions and like where things could go wrong and like, is my Fibonacci handling negative numbers? You know, is, you know, like this is one of the reasons why I'm constantly like asking like, how is this going to break? How, you know, if somebody entered the wrong thing here, is it going to explode your, your thing? And I told you guys last time with QDD, there's a lot of programmers whose attitude is like, well, it's the fault of the person who, uh, it's the fault of the person who entered the bad data, right? It's the fault of the person who entered a negative route distance. It's his fault the internet went down. And to me, the answer is no. <laughs> Whoever wrote the software is at fault because they should have handled the error condition. Do not write code that will allow the internet to explode if one person somewhere on their internet types a negative. Like that is just like, it's not my fault. Yeah, it is. Yeah, it is. It's your fault. You wrote bad code. I'm sorry. <laughs> write better code. Don't write code that crashes. Don't write code that will crash the internet if somebody enters one extra character. That is that is bad software engineering. I'm sorry. That's a hill I'm going to die on. So uh, I write my code so that it doesn't crash. Like I write code that will handle any input. And if you give me an error condition, I'll throw an exception or die or you know something but I will not write code that will uh, allow the internet to go down. Uh, drill pick. <laughs> this is the uh, Hawaii, uh, this is the Hawaii uh, nuclear thing, huh? <laughs> yeah, that's funny. Uh, yeah, that's bad design. Sorry. Um, can't really blame the user. Yeah. Blame, blame the people that made that, that system for sure. Like, to me, to me, software engineering is good software engineering. Good programming is the ability to have absolute noise thrown at your program, people throwing spaghetti against the wall, uh, cats walking on a keyboard, people putting their face down on the keyboard and rolling it left and right. Your code shouldn't crash. Sorry. Like, oh, the fault of the person who typed it. No, no, it's your fault. You wrote bad code. So, um, okay. So how do you hold a graph? Uh, there's two main ways of holding a graph. This is a data structure. Um, see if it breaks. Yeah, honestly, actually, just uh, just entering random data into your code to see if it breaks is actually a good technique. Um, I was hired by the um, electrical engineering department at UCSD, and they gave me some code they wanted me to, to fix up and port. And uh, so I started off by just feeding it all zeros black, right? It's a video conferencing system. I just gave it black. There's no, you know, just all zero pixels. Seg fault. <laughs> the system did not work if you gave it all black. Any any color at all, it wouldn't crash. But if you just gave it black, like you left the lens cap on, it would seg fault. I'm like, yeah, that's a problem. That's a problem. Uh, if you gave it, uh, if you give it random noise, it would have issues. Uh, running time on it was like order in cubed when it should be like order I don't know, in or something like that. Um, the one at the top matches my online usernames because it exists in case I enter Hawaii. That's hilarious. Um, yeah. So the, uh, there, are two there are two different ways you can hold a graph. The first way is with an adjacency matrix. So it's just a 2D, it's just a 2D array. So here we've got five, uh, five vertices and we just have a true if they are connected. So one and two. Row one, column two, true. Row two, column one, true. Row two, column three, true. Row three, column two, true. All right. What about three and one? Row one, column three, false. You guys see that? Now, what's the downside to this? There, this is order one, insert, order one, search, order one, delete. What's the downside to this? The downside is hard to read. Yeah. I mean... You know, you go row five, column four. It's, it's not too bad, right? 
Not too bad. True. And if you want weights on it, like if you want to have the distance between them instead of a true or false, you just put an integer there or a floater, whatever. What's what's the downside of this? How much RAM is this going to take up? If you if you're doing this for five cities, how many entries do we need in the adjacency matrix? How many? Uh, what is our space complexity? Space complexity is not something we usually talk about in computer science um, because RAM's cheap. But in cases like this, uh, we got to talk about it. Um, order two to the n. Mm, it's not. It's five squared. It's n squared. It's not two to the n, which would be really bad. It's just bad. It's not really bad. Okay. Yeah. So to hold five cities, we need twenty-five entries. What if we're holding Facebook, and Facebook has a billion entries? How many? How many entries are we going to have? There's a reason why Facebook limits you to five thousand friends. So if you have a million billion times, uh, that is a lot of RAM. It's megabytes, gigabytes, terabytes, petabytes, exabytes. Yeah. It's a lot of RAM. Nobody's got an exabyte of RAM, not even Facebook. Okay, so adjacency matrices are fine for small graphs, and you just set them to, you know, you just make a 2D array. Like, you guys could do this, right? Like, it's not, not too bad. You can destroy Facebook with a power friendship. No, they use a better they use a, ba a better data structure. It's a little bit slower in time complexity, but the space complexity is order, you know, order basically the number of people plus the number of friendships. So n plus n, you might say. So, um, which is fine because uh, you can hold a, a thousand people. It's like a couple gigs of RAM. Um, you can also hold them directed. So directed graph, like imagine these are city streets and you're trying to navigate from, you're trying to navigate from one to four. If they're you just your normal streets, like Blackstone is here, you know, you could drive south, you can drive north. But what do we call streets where you can only drive one way on them? What do you guys think? What is, what is the term for a street where you can only drive one way on the street? Very good. A one-way street. Excellent. So let's say we've got here uh, one-way streets. Okay. So you can drive from one to two, but you can't drive from two to one. So what is the fastest route from one to four now? What do you guys think? A dead end? Well, you could get a dead end, right? Like if you end up with a situation where the one-way streets kind of end in a vertex and there's no way out, it's a dead end. Right? So one to five to four. Nope. You just got a you just got a ticket. That's a moving violation to go from one to five. Look at that; the arrow's pointed up, right? Uh, <laughs> if you were me, you wouldn't be able to get out of that ticket. If you're my wife, she just is like, "Oh, I'm so tired." Gets out of the ticket every time. It's amazing. One to two to three to five to four. That is correct. So boom, 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 boom. Yes, that is correct. So. Uh, navigating is a little bit more tricky, right? But do you guys understand the, the concept of like a directional graph? So one, uh, let's see here. So one to five. So they're having kind of backwards. Okay. Uh, so five connects to one. So that's column one, row five. I've probably done it the other way, whatever. So five is connected to one. So column five, row one. One is connected to two. So call, uh, So row two, column one. Um, no, row two, column one, so row one, column five, row two, column, I don't know, uh, and then row three, column two means two is connected to three, row three, column four means three is connected from four. I would, I would probably mirror image them. It's a little weird. Um, how is it represented in code? I mean, it's just this. That's the code for it. Make it 2D. It's a 10 by 10 matrix. We don't even need it to be 10 by 10. 5 by 5 would be fine. And so I'm just saying, you know, that's it. That's that's the code. It's not too bad, right, Messick? Now, how you, the, the algorithms to run across them and do shortest paths and things like that, you'll learn that in 26. I'm just introducing the data structure to you because this is a data structures class. 
That's it. So I'm just hand setting each of these things. You know, for this one. It's not the unidirectional one. It's a bidirectional one. Tedious, but yeah, doable. Um, so yeah, so if we wanted to go from four to two, we could go four to one to three to two, or you go from four to three to two. So this would be the shortest path here. Okay. Now you've you have seen a graph already in this class. A BST, a binary search tree, is a graph. Right? We call that guy root. And uh, if this represented, like, uh, I don't know, Twitter followers or something, like I said, graphs can represent just a huge number of different things. So maybe, because, you know, like on Facebook, like it's bi directional friendship, right? I, if I friend you, you friend me back, you know. But on Twitter, you just follow people. So, like, person seven is following person three, and person three is following person one, and person six. And person three is six is following four, and four is following five. You guys understand? So, um, this, you know, this is a graph. Now, we use a binary search tree to, like, store and retrieve data, but it's technically a graph. There's vertices and edges. And it's specifically something called a DAG, a directed, ASIC, a directed acyclic graph. Directed means got arrows on the things that are not bidirectional and acyclic means there's no cycles anywhere within it and so there's a lot of there's a lot of graphs that only work on DAGs and, and things like that different different algorithms for different kinds of graphs um, so what is the better way of holding a matrix than this well let's see if I can have the tablet work actually you know what? I'm just gonna use, I'm just gonna go to the server Do, uh, vertex. So for every city on the map, we'll have like a name. Let's make this struct. Do as I say, not as I do. Uh, we'll have a string name. So every city will have a name. And then it'll have a list of people that it's connected to. So like, let's, let's try and do, let's do this one. Let's do this. Let's try and recreate this graph. Okay, so who is St. Paul connected to? Who is St. Paul connected to? We'll just use numbers. We, we, don't, we don't actually need names, I guess. What numbers is St. Paul connected to? Four, two, and three. And itself, I guess, maybe. And who is two connected to? One, three, four, and five, et cetera, et cetera. So, rather than having a giant 2D Rather than having a giant 2D uh, array like that, what we can do is we just have um, some sort of data structure, events holding like who who we're connected to. And so we call edges. Okay. So what data structure should we use? For every number, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, we're either connected to them or we're not. And we need to be, be able to very quickly ask are we connected to this number or are we not connected to this number? Um, order one is ideal. Order login is also good. Not as ideal as order one. What data structure is used to hold if something is in the data structure or not in the data structure quickly? What do we call that? Either something is in the blank or not in the blank. What data structure? An ordered map is overkill. We don't need a map for this. What's the simplified version of a hash map? Hash table. Uh, <laughs> what's this? What's the STD name? What's the name in the standard library of holding? Uh, yes, we're connected to two, or no, we're not connected to two. Set. Very good. Yeah, BSD set. Beautiful. So that would work. Uh, if you want a little bit more speed, unordered set also works just fine. I would, I would probably use an unordered set, honestly. But you know what the benefit of a set is? It's always sorted, right? So all the numbers, like if you print them, they'll just come out 
you know, in alphabetical order. It's really nice. Okay, uh, and so here we go. Let's do this. So we've got a vertex, uh, let's see here, let's see, vector of vertices named vec. True. Uh, string name is equal to read. Please enter the name of a city. Quit. Quit. Right, San Diego, Los Angeles, Des Moines. What do we got here? St. Paul, Madison, Lansing. All right, so we'll type in the name, and this is just for decoration, just to make it look nice. Um, and then uh, we will say uh, do, 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 do. Okay, vertex uh, new guy is equal to name, and if name is quit, break. So we're gonna make a new vertex with San Diego in it or Lansing or whatever. Um, bu 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 bum. And then we will do another while loop. While true. And we're going to ask who it's connected to. So like while we're in, while we're inputting St. Paul, we're going to type in Des Moines, um, Madison, Lansing, whatever. Um, okay. Uh, so int uh, edge is equal to read. Please enter the index of the city we're connected to. Negative one to put. If edge is less than zero, break. And we will make a new guy dot edges dot. How do we insert into a set? So uh, basically, edges is going to hold a list of everybody that we're connected to. So for uh, St. Paul here, we're going to insert two into it. We're going to insert three into it. We're going to insert four into it, but not five and not six and not seven, because these are the people we're connected to. And then using a set, you can ask it, hey, am I connected to two? Yes. Cool. There's a road there. Am I connected to five? No. All right. Cool. There's no, there's no connection there. So how do I insert into a set? You guys remember? What's the name of the function that does insert? It is on the screen. Hmm. Equal range, get allocator. Yeah, insert, okay. So we will insert the number here. Right. And then, um, yeah. And then we will add it to the vector. So vector dot push back new guy. Okay, right, so basically this code here is going to read one city at a time. I'm inputting San Diego. Who's San Diego connected to? LA, Phoenix, whatever. And then after we're done inputting everything, it gets added to the vector of cities. And uh, we're good. We call this cities. Now we can ask it who we're, who we're connected to. Okay. So uh, while true, um, probably should do this using a map. Uh, if we're gonna if we're gonna do a lookup based on name, let's just do it a lookup based on index. It'd be cooler to do a look at based on name that we could do a map, a mapping between a, a name and a city. Uh, but I've gone too far at this point. So we will just do a look at based on index. Okay. So int index equals read. Uh, please enter the index of this city you want to look up. Okay. And then, all right. So here's a question. We've got our cities. We've got like 10 cities read in at this point. And the user types in a number. What should we check for? In sort. <laughs> what should we check for? What kind of errors could happen? 
every time. Like, this is, like, the kind of paranoia I want from you guys. What happens if, uh, see, here I'm handling negative numbers by just quitting. Right? But there's also a possibility that these numbers are going to be for City 9 million, which doesn't exist. But we don't know if City 9 million is going to exist at this point, so we just have to add it to our list of edges and look it up later. Squirrels. Yeah, uh, well, the read, the read library itself actually will throw away the squirrel and reprompt, which is one of the reasons why the read library is superior to CN. Uh, but it'll give, us, it'll give us an integer for sure. What problems could be... Uh, yeah, yeah, if you type in squirrel, it'll just throw it away and ask you again. It, it will give you an integer. It's one of the reasons why the read library is superior. Like, if you ask, if you ask it for an int... By golly, it'll give you an it. It just, it will. <laughs> unless unless the keyboard gets set on fire, in which case it'll return zero. So what, what do we have to watch out for? What indices could be bad? Like we if we just said like vector dot at index, like what, what would be an error condition here? Too big or this is a signed integer. What possible numbers are going to cause us a problem here? Negatives, exactly. So I'm going to handle that by just saying negative to quit. All right, easy. If index is less than zero, then break, bye bye. And then if index is greater than or equal to uh, cities.size, then uh, yeah, we'll just also break. Who cares? Okay. We probably should print an error message or something. We'll just quit. Okay. And this code pattern you have to get used to. Uh, checking for less than a value or greater than or equal to another value. That's the half open range pattern. Underflow or overflow, if they type in 9 billion, the read library will handle that. Uh, you don't have to worry about it. You will get an integer from negative 2 billion ish to positive 2 billion ish. But there are no negative indices in the vector. So uh, we just handle that by quitting. And if they type in something that is bigger than the number of cities we have, we quit. Easy. Read library is nice. It is. It is the superior solution. Okay. So now we know that we have a valid city. What we'll do is we will see out city name. Do you guys hear that? There's a lawnmower going on outside of my window. City name is going to be cities.at index. So that's going to print out San Diego or whatever. And then we want to print out all of its friends, right? We want to print out all of the people that are connected to San Diego, all the people connected to Des Moines. So how do I do that? How do I, how do I print How do I print the name of every person that we're connected to? It's not picking up good. I, I have a directional mic, but the dude is just idling his uh, lawn, his riding lawnmower outside of my window. Print out it's set. Okay. So, doo -doo 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 -doo. so for everything in uh, da -da 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 -da, cities dot at index dot edges, and the edges are all integers. So we will say for every integer x in there. So this is going to get every every number, but we want to print out their names. I'm going to print out their names. Yeah, cities is uh, cities at the edges of the current guy is a list of integers. We want to get their names. X dot name. Uh, yeah, uh, close. It's going to be cities dot at x dot name. But we don't know if X is valid or not, right? Because what if the user had inputted uh, Los Angeles is connected to city 9 million and there is no city 9 million? What should we check before we do this? Now, the dot at, the dot at will catch it and throw an exception, but I don't like my program style. If contains, yeah, it's good. Enough. Uh, but contains is for the set. We want to know if... Because uh, it's going to be like the numbers that it holds is like the index and the vector. So St. Paul is going to hold 2, 3, and 4. I, I'm holding index 2, 3, and 4. 
in the vector. Those those are the indices that are connected to me. Um, and, but let's say the, these are fat fingers that, and enters 40 instead of 4. You want to know, is 40 actually in the, the vector? How do we do that? How do we check to see if 40 is a valid member of cities? Find. If x is less than 0, or if x is greater than or equal to cities.size. Uh, that's all we have to do. Because these are indexes into a, ver uh, into a vector, right? And so I am I am friends with person in index five. Well, there is no index five, die, right? And so we should die here or see out invalid index. Yeah. Give him a nice little error message. We're not gonna quit, we're not gonna quit. We're just gonna, we're just gonna handle it like a champion. So if the, if the person is friends with a uh, person nine million, and there is no person 9 million, it's just going to print out invalid index 9 million. Otherwise, it's going to grab uh, city.at 9 million and print that one's name. And this is a working graph theory implementation. So this is, uh, I think, uh, Wait, so the name of the city. So San Diego. Ooh. Uh, it's only going to read one one name, right? Let's see, Let's see a read line instead. Okay. San Diego, and we're going to be connected to index one and two and three. Okay. Now we're going to be connected. Uh, so Los Angeles is going to be city one, right? If you guys are keeping track at home, and Los Angeles is going to be connected to San Diego, which is index zero, and it'll be connected to for, I should probably write this down somewhere, um, which would be Sacramento, let's say. And then we'll do Phoenix, 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 Phoenix. Phoenix is going to be connected to San Diego, which is index zero. And it'll be connected to LA. No, it's not. We didn't say it was. Uh, we'll just say it's connected to San Diego. And then San Diego is also connected to three. I don't know. Let's say three is like. Vegas, or something like that. Uh, so Vegas, and Vegas is also connected to San Diego, and it's connected to Sac Town, and then we'll add Sacramento, and Sacramento is connected to Los Angeles, which is index one, and Vegas, which is index three. And we are now done. So now we're gonna look up our city. So if we type in San Diego, which is index zero, it says the city name is San Diego. San Diego is connected to LA, Phoenix, and Vegas. Um, if we look up uh, LA, LA is connected to San Diego and Sacramento. If we look up Phoenix, it's connected to San Diego and nothing else. If we look up Vegas, it's Vegas is connected to San Diego and Sacramento. And Sacramento is connected to LA and Vegas. So we just made a graph that looks like I'm going to have to get a new tablet, I think. This is on its way out. Page. Nope, is it just dead now? So I'm turning on now. Okay, so San Diego. Connected to LA, so San Diego's index zero. SD. And then Phoenix is over here. With an index of two. And we have over here Las Vegas with an index of three. And Sacramento with an index of four. You guys understand? So. If you scroll back up here, see San Diego is connected to one, two, and three. LA is connected to zero and four. San Diego is connected to one, two, and three. LA is connected to zero and four. You see that? Who do you know here? Index five, wrong, die. This, does this make sense? Like this is like, 
a graph. Doing the thing, doing the thing. Yeah. Graph. Pin the thing in. And never change Wacom. All right. There. Was this slower than the 2D vector? If so, why? Well, um, looking up something out of the uh, set is order of login time. If we use the hash table, it would be order one. And so hash table is probably the right solution here. Um, but uh, login is plenty fast. So the, uh, the adjacency matrix would be able to do insert, search, and delete in order one time. The, uh, the set method here is going to take order login time, which is slower than order one. Um, each, each of the operations here is order login, which is slower. But I like it just because it keeps everything sorted. So if you were to just be like, Print out all my friends alphabetically. It's all sorted for you. It's nice. Uh, we could make this just as fast as the adjacency matrix by making it an unordered set. Like that. Are we good? We're good. And now it's order one, insert, search, and delete. With a lot less memory usage. So there you go. This is a working graph um, program. It builds a graph and then allows you to look up um, all of the friends of one person. Um, so we'll put this up into copy main.cc, this slash public slash graph. Uh, graph cities, I don't know, .cc. And that is available there for you. Any questions about that? You're gonna you're gonna get like lots of lectures on this in discrete math. I'm just kind of kind of previewing it for you because this is a data structure, right? Every uh, every city has connections to other cities, and there are lots of things you can do with it. We're not doing it right now. We'll save this to 26. Where you do things like find the fastest route between San Diego and Sacramento, uh, or print out all of your friends on Facebook, and then print out all of your friends' friends on Facebook. You know things like that. There's just an infinite number of uses for graph theory, and so I like to I like to kind of tease it a little bit in uh, in this class. Twenty six is a is a good class, and you are going to learn a little bit of C plus plus in it. But you've like I said, you've you've learned pretty much um, all of the C plus plus you need to know. Oh, uh, all right. you have permissions now. Try now. There it is. This will build a graph and allow you to, uh, you don't, it, we're not doing like graph traversal. Graph traversal means like going from one to the other, to another, to another, but we are at least printing all of the friends, all of the cities that you're connected to, things like that. 26 does assume that you know C++, yeah. So if you're gonna be, does 26 have a lot of coding? Mine was all theory. Mine was all theory too. I had two, I had two quarters of discrete math in a row. And it was all proofs. Every Friday night, I was in the coffee shop, chugging coffee, working on my problem sets, doing proofs and things like that. The way that I teach 26, though, it's half programming and it's half math. And so, because um, I feel like actually coding shortest paths or whatever teaches you shortest paths much better than like just solving it on paper or something like that. It's like when you've when you've gone to the effort of like actually implementing Facebook or Twitter, you know, like simulating like friendships and things like that. Um, you get it like you, you learn by doing, you know, and so rather than just reading about something like I'm not expecting any of you to be able to do this because I'm just showing it to you. You're not coding it. You don't have a programming assignment for this. Um, I'm just kind of teasing it for you for next semester. Um, that when you actually do something, that's when you actually learn it. Like you actually struggle with it and you know, you demonstrate you understanding it by doing it. So, programming helps math understand the proofs. 
Yeah. All right. So that is that is a gentle introduction to graph theory. Stay tuned for next semester for the uh, the the whole enchilada.